Welcome to the Masters of Engineering podcast. Cool products, the people who develop them, and how they do it. I'm John Hirschstick, your host. I'm Chief Evangelist here at PTC and a co-founder of Onshape and formerly a co-founder of SolidWorks. I spent my life building CAD and PDM software for product developers, but the coolest part of my job is not just the software I build, but it's the people I meet who develop products. And in my podcast, you get to meet them too. So today, really exciting guests from Ox Delivers. They're doing something that's not only a really cool design project, but it's great for the world too, helping some people who really need help in Rwanda. Um, I wanna welcome to the podcast, Christiana Hamilton and Natalie Dowsett from Ox Delivers. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Yeah, thank you for having us. Well, thanks for being here because it is it is a great story. And um, I want to just start. Can can one or both of you tell us what are you doing at Ox Delivers? Yeah, sure. So at Ox Delivers, we are developing transport as a service in emerging markets. So that is clean, affordable transport for you know there's three billion people in the world that don't have access to motorized transport, and that prohibits people in building prosperous businesses and increasing their incomes. Why Rwanda? When we started the company, we knew that we wanted to develop the electric truck, which would be an enabler to offering that transport at low cost, um, but also go and find um, product market fit and also prove out the demand assumption in our business model whilst doing a pilot operation. So we looked uh, where we could do this and Rwanda was the perfect fit for many different reasons to go and learn and start a pilot operation because ultimately we are looking at this being a an opportunity that that is across the global south so you say that that you know with all the different electric vehicles in the world that exist obviously there wasn't one right for the job can you tell us about your the ox electric truck and what's unique about it can you elaborate on that christiana are you okay to take yeah, this that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um the main thing that we would struggle with within those markets specifically in rwanda is the difficulty that you face on the roads so there are very limited amount of roads that are actually full tarmac and a lot of our entrepreneurs as a uh, natalie said are rural farmers so we have to get up muddy dirt tracks with uh, very little grip and um, difficult roads to navigate. So when most EVs at the minute uh, are passenger cars, there are a few coming into market now that are more ruggedized and, and trucks, but they don't have the carrying capability. They still do not have the capability to navigate the difficulty of roads and they are also too expensive for our business model so that the people who we uh, supply transport to can afford it our truck also needs to be affordable to produce so we're aiming for a low-cost truck that can navigate these difficult roads um, and situations uh, and that's just not on the market at the minute so we are doing it ourselves sorry i, I just um i'd like to add as well that um, the way we are designing it is completely different because we're looking yes. at um, lifetime cost operating expense is what matters to us. Oh. We're not looking at, uh, you know, a, a retail price for a customer. We're looking mm -hmm. at, uh, you know, what is the 10, 20 year cost of each vehicle that we produce, which means you design it in a totally different way. Yeah. So you focus oh. more on reliability and serviceability and also access to components within markets. So if we took a really um, high spec vehicle and something was to break on it in market, being able to get the supply of new components is really difficult. Our truck is designed specifically so that we can access materials in market with easy supply. So it's easily repairable and the truck has less downtime to ensure that we facilitate everyone as often as possible. Well, and to say that you're using some unusual materials for vehicles is kind of an understatement. Can you elaborate in more detail about, you know, if, if, if we don't have the, the truck here and we can't bring our yeah. listeners there, but if they were, tell us specifically about some of the materials that you're using, which are unusual in, in vehicles. So 
Yeah, one of the, the main ones that is considered unusual is the use of plywood panels. Yeah. So rather than utilising what you would see on most vehicles, we have metal pressings for the sides or uh, even some plastic components. We use sheet material that's completely flat. So it's a very boxy truck um, and it's just simple bolt on, bolt off. So that if there is to be, uh, say, you hit a branch on a tree in it, and it scratches the panel it's easy to just cut a new one take it off and replace it so the, the additional benefit as well is when you're not looking at fancy shapings for door panels and everything you can save a lot of space yeah. so these um these trucks are ambition in the next phase of our manufacturing will be to send out kits so flat pack kits um so you can go from fitting two trucks fully made trucks in a shipping container to six kits and then you can assemble them locally yeah i i just found that amazing you know this is so creative what you're doing because you know you're not just looking at uh, existing designs and saying let's squeeze a few pennies out here and there by resourcing you're you're just rethinking it in some really i find really um it's so clever to think who would think about packing a vehicle like a flat pack and using plywood sheets, you know, really cool. So going back to the business model, I, I, are you being like the Uber for African farmers or maybe the zip car? Is, is that a model you look at and so, say we want to be like one of those? So I guess, yeah, there's, there's similarities. You could say we're Uber for potatoes. Um, <laughs> however, the difference is the, the main differences would be, um, our driver plus model. So we are not working in a gig economy here. We, we employ our drivers and we call them driver plus because they're so much more than a driver, right? They are marketing the service. They're providing oh, yeah. the service. So ensuring that the truck is um, utilized, that it's running is, and, and it's, it's fully, fully filled as much as possible is absolutely in their, incentive so it's an on-demand transport for your goods so as much space as you need because transport in africa is extremely expensive and um, so rather than having to hire a whole truck you could just hire the space that you need as far as you need it and what we're doing is developing the the digital platform that makes sure that we can make margins through that and um, because it is high truck utilization rates backhaul, ensuring we're being efficient and and um, optimizing our logistics service. That's really fascinating. And I because you know, even in 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 um, in say the United States and a lot of Western countries there's talk about the gig economy and the, the workers, the drivers not making a living wage. And it sounds like you're targeting this job to be something that develops their career and I presume earns a good wage, earns a living wage. Yeah. To, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, we are, we have no interest in creating a positive social impact in one space whilst creating a negative one in another space. So yes, we um, provide a, a, a good a good wage. Um, many of our drivers actually live at the depot. Their um, food and accommodation wow. is provided. Um, actually, we provide childcare for drivers that have children. It's a really amazing. And to bring it to life a little more, even, could you tell me what would be a, a typical transaction? I can tell you a story about a woman I met in Rwanda when I was there in February. Um, she is a banana trader at Namagabi Market. And she will call her Marie Louise for the sake of her name. Um, and so what she had to do to get her goods, would she, she would travel to a rural market to buy her stock but she couldn't afford to rent a truck to get her goods back which meant she could either walk or push a bike and it was too far so her only other option was to hitch a ride on a passing truck or bus oh. the thing is that could take three days right so in those three days this is you know this is a real story of a woman i met so in those three days she would be her, her stall is empty She's not there. She's not making money. Her stock is spoiling because it's sat by the side of the road. And she is sleeping by the side of the road, like unsafe, alone. 
um, she would form a cooperative with other women, actually, that would be also doing the same thing, to hire a security guard to watch them while they sleep. So you can, oh. I mean, that's a real, you know, pain point, a true pain point that she was going through. And now with Ox, she can, she's been able to, she be more productive because she can stay at her market store. She can diversify which goods she gets because she's able to, to get more goods. She doesn't have to spend time at the side of the road um, and safe. So the, the the range, so that that's one customer I spoke to. And then another customer is shipping um, sacks of potatoes and mm -hmm. they have, you know, hundreds of kilos of potatoes that they're transporting on a very dangerous road for what the alternative would be to push it on a bike so they would have 200 kilos of potatoes on the back of a okay, push bike kilos. right and wow. these roads like uh they call rwanda the land of a thousand hills because it is yeah. hills everywhere you look right so these roads are mm. up and down so you put 200 kilos on the back of a bike going downhill that's really dangerous and people will die because they are going off the road they're being they can't stop so but now we're able to take take the potatoes for them they don't have to take all the time moving them and being unproductive whilst they're making a big journey a dangerous journey and um, they can trust us to deliver their goods how do they reach you how do they arrange the transaction so there's there's two ways people can apart from just kind of knowing the driver and asking them um but there's also a free phone phone number that's on the side of all the trucks and um, so people will obviously see that we're providing transport and they call and they book their um delivery but also we have an app that has um that enables customers using technology like that is enabled on 2g phones so we're not talking like a smartphone app it's more of a yeah. 2G phone app because that's more common in Africa um, using USSD technology, which is not really commonly known technology. Um, but it's, I don't know if you if you put in a short code and you get your IMEI number on your on your yeah. mobile phone, um, that yeah. is USSD technology. So it's, it's not the same as oh. a smart, smartphone app. And then how about payment? How does payment happen? Yeah, so payment, um, we're actually almost 100% cashless now. In in Africa, there is, um, and in Rwanda, there is a, um, a, typically people use mobile money. So they um, transfer money through mobile phone numbers. And so most of our transactions are cashless through mobile money. Can I um, ask about your personal backgrounds? How did you come to do this? Christiana, you want to start? Sure, I'll start. Um, so, um, yeah, so I sort of started getting into engineering at a particularly young age. So in um, my, where I'm from, Scotland, we have a, a particular a subject at school called graphic communication. And it allows you to learn CAD, engineering drawings, how to render it's literally it's it's essentially mm. a small engineering course and i started that at a really like at age 11 and was age that 11. was it 11. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah wow. i started i started then and that was it I, there was nothing else that i wanted to do i became super invested in cad um and also i, I grew up loving cars as well so i went to university i did a degree in automotive engineering um, at the University of Warwick. Uh, within that, I did a placement at um, Nissan within their manufacturing division. Um, sort of was okay with the OEM, could consider it. And then I thought, I'll try consultancy. So I went to a consultancy called Ricardo. I was there for two years. I worked within uh, business development and um, different forms of design uh, and did a variety of different things. And then one of my friends happened to mention this company called Ox and that they were looking for an engineer. Oh. And after having sort of had an experience of OEM and consultancy, I was like, this feels more my speed in terms of I'm not, I, I will be helping and 
know that I am helping a large group of people with because there's such potential here to help so many um, to grow within their own communities and it just it really struck a chord with me so I stuck an application in and now they're stuck with me so <laughs> but I absolutely adore my job it is I, I right. love it is an amazing company to work for and uh, Natalie has done a very good job setting it up with Simon so yeah and so Christiana you actually have designed you know a lot of the vehicle you know yeah. yourself so That's yeah so great. i'm predominantly involved well initially predominantly involved in designing the cab so the structure the yeah. dashboard the seats everything that the driver will touch however now we're we're looking um at a bit of a redesign so we're starting sort of from the ground up so we're currently looking at suspension so i've been recently looking at how we implement different forms of suspension and working on kinematic models with uh, some of our other engineers so i've built it designed it driven it tested it uh you sort of end up touching everything really <laughs> it's That's great 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 story and and natalie what's your background how do you get here so I think there's a bit of a theme here. So um, I, so yeah, at 11 years old, I decided I wanted to be an automotive engineer and was pretty blinkered in my pursuit of achieving that career um, because I had um, every year had visited the 24 hour Le Mans race in France and just oh, wow. loved it. Um, I That was from a very young age and I was very, um, I just I just loved it. It really inspired my passion for cars um, and, and vehicles and engineering. And so I went to university and I did mechanical engineering um, and very quickly went into um, work at Jaguar Land Rover. So I worked as a package engineer for a few years at Jaguar Land Rover before I decided, actually, I want to understand a little bit more on the business side. So I went into a uh, business strategy. So this was looking at future products. What does the business need in the future and creating a business case for that to then take to the executive team for them to make decisions on. And then after that, I went into communications um, because I have always had a love for telling a story, which is probably why this is going to be a long podcast, right? <laughs> but I've always... <laughs> always yeah. had a love for telling a story and so I really honed that skill um working in communications um and then I left Jaguar Land Rover uh, looking for something a little bit more purposeful um I had had children in the meantime your perspective on life changes and I really felt I just didn't want to be driven by um creating more products for people that have an abundance of products to choose from um, mm -hmm. and just um, saturate in a marketplace that is already, mm -hmm. you know, more than adequate. Mm -hmm. So then I um, I joined Simon, my co-founder. Um, he or we we met during our business strategy time, strategy time at Jaguar mm -hmm. Land Rover. Um, and then we we launched Ox Delivers in October 2020 and um, so it turns out using storytelling and, and and a background of storytelling and business case creation is really helpful when you're starting a startup um, Agree but I have that. to say yeah <laughs> and, uh, I have to say listening to Christiana talk about her time at Ox and her her love for engineering is making me want to maybe change teams. <laughs> I wanted to ask you you said you started you're building on it, sort of a where you are, where you're going. So you started in in Rwanda in two thousand, the end of two thousand twenty, and in in there's a CNN story on Ox Delivers. Um, you said I think there were like two trucks in two thousand twenty one or something. Can you tell us how many are out there? How many are electric? How many are out there right now? What's the ultimate goal? Um, if there is sure. one in Rwanda, March twenty twenty one was when we got our first customer um which was the the coffee company and we had two trucks just providing transport and from there we've we've developed and learned um an awful lot um and we've been able to now expand into four depots across the country um last year alone we served over 2000 customers um, really? and moved 13000 tons of goods um wow. so and we've We've pr proven the commercial model too, and um, we've right. we've hit some impressive 
revenue annualized run rate so you know we've 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 learned a lot we've developed a lot um i think going forward so we will want to expand across rwanda as i said these are local operations serving communities so expand across rwanda um to expand the the um geography of the service and then also look at second and third markets because again this is a this is an issue this is a problem that we are providing a solution for this problem is, is across the global south there are many markets um that have that have a lack of transport that we see as a huge opportunity christiana i, I heard from natalie about a, a trip a recent trip and your great story about the banana um uh, uh vendor uh, but Christiana, you've also been to Rwanda and do you have any interesting yeah. experiences? Yeah, so um, I went to Rwanda uh, last year around February um, and it was it was really incredible. So I went to both depots and did trips with the DP. So they showed me local markets and we did, uh, I helped do some deliveries and we took some lots of corn to a school um, and up lots of big steep hills and 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 a lot of mud um, in terms of like experience and in, in country it's just that the people are so hard working is one of the main things that that i've seen was they just were so excited by what we could offer that they were willing to just really they just wanted to to move you could tell how passionate they were about what they were trying to do as well and that was really nice for for me to see to know that we really were impacting people because i think it is so easy to be especially based in the uk and be so privileged as i am and, and a lot of us at ox are to, to actually really see that impact and understand it because I think we all, we've also sent out almost all of our engineers to Rwanda. I think there's a couple of people oh, really? who have started more recently, yet yeah. more recently who haven't been, uh, but is planned in for them to go. But it's so that you can get an appreciation for the market. Um, and it's another reason why we work so closely with our technicians, because if they struggle to build the truck, then we're getting we're getting it in the neck, essentially, because they are struggling yeah. to do something. So if we have to build it first, then we know where to where not to what not to do essentially and then on the on the um big topic in you know many parts of the world is you know future uh, vehicles going to be all electric or fossil fuel hybrid you say so you have a couple electric vehicles a lot of diesel vehicles if you look out five years from now do you think your fleet what do you think the 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 mix of electric diesel and perhaps other power sources will be in your fleet in say five years our plan is to go all electric. So diesel, okay. yeah. yeah. We so you're we you're, you're in all electric. Yeah. Yeah. We are, we're yeah. we're fully in. Completely. Um yeah, Christiana's right. We we operate third party diesel trucks at the moment. That is purely yeah. for the learning and to prove okay. um the things that we set out to prove whilst we develop the vehicle. Because otherwise we could get to the end of developing a vehicle and have not it gone is to completely market wrong. And, yeah exactly Completely right. So, yeah yeah right right that's so smart so you know so so the diesel i kind of knew that i kind of knew so you're you're building the vehicle you're building is an electric vehicle the diesel yes. is a yeah. transition but it's really a great lesson for any product developer to not overthink that first release when you want to get product market fit i i see this all the time you know you know it's easy to over rotate on all the details Instead, you did a really wise decision. Final question is, are there any things that our listeners could learn about your process for engineering design? Are you are you using, you know, the, the, the methodologies you use? Mm -hmm. Are those unique? And what can our co largely commercial design audience take away from that? So we focus on using an approach that uses repairability and uh, serviceability as sort of a baseline so we split the truck up not sort of in a traditional sense so normally you have interior exterior you know chassis mm -hmm. or all those things we've broken it up into modules so it's split up into specific sections so the corner of a vehicle if something was to go wrong and that is to fail it's easily bolt take it off bolt a new one on a really good example that we've actually implemented is the front crash structure on the cab so 
there is a section of the cab that is completely bolt on that is intended to take the majority of the impact to save the main structure. So that area is easily removable and put back on rather than having to, you know, worry about large impact going all the way through the chassis and, and disturbing all the structure. And that's a big repair, right? So we focus on this modular structure and breaking it down into smaller parts um, that are just much easier to repair and market and are lower cost as well. I just want to thank you both so much. I could ask you questions all day. I want to also say that it's really special to have um, women leadership in product development. And we're hoping to get this podcast out on the International Women in Engineering Day, June 23rd this year, 2023, as we're recording it. And um, uh, looking forward to that. I want to um, thank you for joining us today. Um, and I want to ask you, can you tell the audience if our listeners or viewers want to learn more about Ox Delivers, where should they go? So to learn more, I would recommend first off the, the website. So that's oxdelivers.com. And also we're pretty active on LinkedIn. If you have, um, if you're on LinkedIn um, and always watch the news because we seem to make a lot of headlines. Yeah. And I have a feeling you're going to make a lot more headlines and it's, it's a wonderful product built by wonderful people with a wonderful mission and impact on the world. So just really, really a pleasure. Um, I want to tell our, our, our listeners and viewers, thank you for tuning in. You can listen to other episodes or masters of engineering or subscribe at Apple podcasts, Google play, Spotify, wherever you find your podcasts. We also are on YouTube with video. You can watch the video as well. We love hearing what you think. Make sure to leave a review and tell us what you thought of Ox Delivers. And I want to say thank you again to both of you. That's it for today. See you all next time on Masters of Engineering.